So we're downloading Starwood.xlsx, and we'll be working on that, but we will be talking about a new idea. Oh, let me show you my background on this idea. This will, how many of you have ever felt in this class, I'm just confused by what's going on in this class at any, any time. Let me sh share with you an experience that I had with this very topic that we're learning today. Um, so that you can say, wow, even Professor Allen didn't always know this stuff. When I was about to, it was 1979, so I guess I was 9, 10, 11, I was 11 years old. Uh, we were visiting my Uncle Jim, who was a brilliant computer programmer, who lived in a large house in the avenues in Salt Lake City. And part of the house divided off into rental units, like the very upstairs was some other rental unit. We were visiting there for the summer, my whole family. And the renter in the top unit fell asleep smoking and lit the house on fire. I'm um, sleeping in a bedroom in the basement. It's about 5 o'clock in the morning. My dad came in open the door, <laughs> and he said, Son, the house is on fire, and the firemen have asked us to evacuate. <laughs> so that, that was, the voice wasn't raised, it wasn't a rush or anything. My dad is not a joker, and so I knew that he was serious. Sure, sure enough, fire trucks, you know, they're spraying water on the house. Anyway, my dad was a builder at this time, and so Uncle Jim hired my dad to remediate the fire damage. Uh, and as part of the payment, he taught him how to program. And then when they were finished, he actually hired my dad. Yes, my dad was good enough to hire him. I'm not sure he was ever really a very good programmer, and he was never a very good teacher, and the combination was deadly, as in what's about to happen. <laughs> so, I was, you know, now maybe 12 or 13 years old, and my dad is trying to teach me this concept that I'm going to teach you today. The concept in programming is called an array. Somebody, you've got computers in front of you. Somebody look up the definition of array. Just go to like, you know, dictionary.com or something. And tell me what, and it, it's, a, it's, it's not a computer term. It's an English language term. What does it mean? Go ahead. I just. An impressive display or range of a particular type of thing. A per, an impressive display. An array is an impressive, keep that up. I might ask you to refer to that again. An impressive display, what does it say, or arrangement of a particular kind of thing. So I could look out here. Now, I'm just going to stand over here in the corner, and I'm going to look over this, and I'm going to say, I see an impressive array. Does that even make sense? <laughs> Does it make so sense to say that? You just say an array, which is already impressive. Okay, I, mean, I, I, I behold an array. Does that make sense? In English, does it make sense? Yeah. What do I have to put on there for that to make sense? An array of something. An array of something. Yeah. I, I behold an array of students, of computers, of desks. I'm done. That's it. Only, only arrays I see there. And so even in the English language, when I say an array, it does not make sense to say an array by itself. An array is an array of something. Okay. That's the background. We're learning about arrays. Today. Keep that up. I might refer to it again. My dad said, son, you're 13 years old. It's time for me to teach you about arrays. <coughs> the talk. The top, yes, yeah, the top. <laughs> Actually, before we get too far, how many of this? How many of you can already use arrays here in some language? I know every time I look at a paycheck, I think to myself, "Boy, I sure could use arrays." <laughs> <laughs> There's not that many jokes here, folks. So, so you got to take them when you can get them. So he tells me, he says, "Okay, he says, son, an array is like pigeonholes." I'm not sure at this time in my life I had ever seen a pigeon, let alone a pigeonhole. I had no idea what it was. But he's trying to explain to me this abstract concept using a metaphor with which I have no experience. <laughs> we do that back and forth about a half hour. And then he says, okay, it's like post office boxes. Now, I was raised in rural um, San Diego County. I had been to the post office in my life maybe twice. And I didn't know even what a post office box was. Now, we had mailboxes, kind of like the ones we have here. You know, a post in the ground with a box on the end. That doesn't help you with understanding what an array is. After about an hour... Of this, I was in tears. I thought, I'm, an, I'm a moron. Why can't I understand this? My father was in tears. My son's a moron. Why can't he understand this? <laughs> <laughs> and we gave up. We spent an hour. We gave up. So I, I tell you that one to help me remember. This is not an easy concept. Um, but also, so you, can, so you can say, you know what? Even Professor Allen had trouble with. True, he was only 13, but still, you know, there was some struggle here involved. But you are in luck. As it turns out, I am a really good teacher. I'm going to help you understand this. You may see it's not too late. The first thing is, is to realize that an array in programming, in, 
The definition again? An, imp an impressive display or range of a particular type of paint. Okay, it is a, it is a, does it say a range or a range? Or range, so let's say. Well, impressive range. Range. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. range is tough because we use range, you know, in, BB, in uh, Excel. Anyway, it's an, it's, it's an impressive group of something. Now, in VBA, it is an array of a particular thing. It is always an array of this particular thing. It is never an array of anything besides this one particular thing. It is so common, we never say what it is. In fact, in most programming books, introductory programming books, they'll talk about an array as if that's enough to say. They never ever say what it's an array of. Can you guess what it is? Any guesses? An array of? Not objects. Arrays, an array of? Any other guesses? Values. Not values. I think I thought I heard it. Variables, yes. That's what an array is. An array is an array of variables. It is an impressive collection of variables. <sighs> What's a variable? It's been a while since we actually talked about it. What's a variable? A variable is something. Named location in memory. A named location in memory. Thank bless you, my son. It's a location in memory, right? You store a value and read it back, and it has a name. So it takes those two things, right? So it's a name and a location in memory. And so when we say an array, it is a large, impressive collection of named locations in memory. You ready to see how to build it? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's, what we have here is this data, um, oh, it's an XLSX. So let me go ahead and save this. Enable editing. And let's save this as an XLSM. Starwood, winter 18. And Alt F11. Insert the module. Okay, we got a brand new blank module here, and we're ready to go. Oh, so yeah, the data that we're dealing with here is these are several properties that are owned by the Starwood Corporation. You haven't heard of Starwood, but you've heard of the Sheraton. It's the parent company of the Sheraton. You've heard of the Westin. It's the parent company of the Westin. You may have heard of some of these that look like the Regis. Anyway, it's hotels. So it's various, various hotels. W. Uh, and so if you look over here on distance, we can see the names of some of these hotels here. And we'll, we'll be dealing with this data later. So let's suppose that I wanted to be able to have each of these hotel names in a different variable. Okay, no problem. Here's what I'm going to do. I'll create a sub-procedure. Ooh. I have to log into someone else today, so let me go ahead and make a couple of uh, adjustments here. So, editor format size. I don't know if this will go bigger or not. I definitely want Microsoft. Microsoft Sans Serif Western font. Okay. Sub. Hmm. Why don't we call this initializer just in it? And typically, when we declare a variable, we declare it in here. Dim hotel. <coughs> dim hotel as a string. And what I might do, I gotta do, and there's like 30, there's like 36 of these things. So maybe I'll dim hotel one as a string. Don't do this all with me. I'm gonna do a bunch of work here and I'm gonna delete it. Sit back and enjoy the show. Dim hotel two, hotel three, hotel four, hotel five. Now I want to I want to plug. I got to go all the way to thirty six. That's a lot. <sighs> Maybe I'll let's go ahead and at least get some of these populated. Hotel one equals. Uh, let's see, and then I've got a worksheet over here. Distance. I want to type that all the time. So let me go ahead and declare a, a, a variable here. Dim d as a worksheet. Set d equal to worksheets. Distance. Okay, so hotel one is going to be s dot cells row number. What row is it? Row number two, column number one dot value. Okay, so that is going to read into my variable hotel one. It's going to read in my first value. So I've got hotel one, two, three, four, five. Ooh. That's going to come from row number. That's row number. 
starts in row number two, column number one. So two, three, four, five, six. Uh, yeah, I can print it out. I don't want to print it out. We'll just take a peek at it here in a minute. So we go here at breakpoint and code, stop, and we'll run this. Object required. So, oh, it should be D, thank you. I'm so used to using S for a worksheet. There we go. So now I should be able to look at this and let's take a look. So I'm, I'm paused now at this location. I should be able to look at what's in Hotel One. Oh, Sheridan downtown Los Angeles. What's in Hotel Five? The Phoenician is in Hotel Five. And so, so far so good, right? I declared a bunch of variables, put values in. The trouble is, it's a lot of work to declare all these variables. Wouldn't it be great if there was a way that I could create an array of variables with one statement? If only there was a way to do that. And that's what we're going to do right now. So instead of dim hotel, I better stop this. Instead of dim hotel one, I'm going to say hotel, and then right here in parentheses, instead of putting a one there, I'm going to say hotel, and then I'm going to put some number, 35. I have now declared a bunch of variables. I've declared a whole array of variables. What's, it, what's an array again? It is a, an impressive collection or range of variables. That's what I've done here. Here it is. 30, how many did I make? 36. It's a trick. It starts with zero. It starts counting with zero. Most places in VBA, we start counting at one. Like collections, we start counting at one. You want to know which worksheets I got here? First one's number one. Uh, but with arrays, we start at zero. It turns out we can put an option up here. We can say option base one. That's it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Arrays are going to start counting at one. We are not going to do that in this class. It would make your life moderately easier this week because you're used to starting to count at one. But here's the problem. Almost every place you'll see arrays, they start counting at zero. I mean, you go look at someone else's code, it's going to start at zero. And here's the thing. You learn how to do arrays with one-based indexing, and you will struggle with zero-based indexing for the rest of your life. It won't, be, it won't feel natural. But if you learn with zero-based indexing, it's a little bit more difficult to start, but making the switch to a one-based index, if you ever have to deal with it, is a breeze. So we're going we're gonna to stick with zero-based indexing. OK, so now we can't, we can't refer to the variables this way. I mean, this is, a, this is a variable name one. We now have to refer to it somehow different. How will we do it? What do we do down here? Parentheses. Yeah, instead of the one, I just put that, that one in parentheses. But where does it start counting? It starts counting at zero. So I would be at zero, I could have one, I could have two. Oh, that's enough. I'm going to leave those. <coughs> What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, so we're going to simplify this as well. Yeah, this, is, this doesn't seem to have helped me so much uh, yet, but it will here shortly. So now, anytime we look at this, and the whole reason that we want to do this, declare these variables as an array of variables rather than as individual variables, is because when I'm dealing with an individual variable name, I have to specify this whole name out. That's a token. That is something that has to be written out by itself. I can't somehow bind, use a variable and attach that to this variable name. Like, I can't do that. It's got to be the whole name. But with an array, where this index goes, I can have any expression that evaluates to an integer that's in the valid range. Anything that goes between 0 and 35, however it gets calculated, I can drop that right. I can put a call to a function there. I can do some math there. I can put a variable there. And that's where this becomes magic. Because now I've got three lines that are exactly the same except for what? Except for this number in this spot and this number in this spot. And look, they both increase by one every time. What is this calling out for? This is saying, please make a loop. Okay. Dim x as integer. For x equals 0 to 35. Next. So I want to convert these three lines down into one. What do I put right here? X goes here, and what goes here? X plus 2. So now the first time through, that's still going to be 0. This expression here will be 2. 
Next time through, this will be one. This expression will be three. One, three. Next time through, it'll be two and four. So we can get rid of these. And I've now written a loop that will run through and fill up that whole array with just this loop right here. I have one line to declare all those variables, and then one loop to fill all those variables up. I should be able to run this code to my breakpoint again, and then come over here and peek. Hotel sub five is the Westin, the Westin Keyerland Resort and Spa. Hotel sub four should still be the Venetian. It was hotel five when we had it numbered because we were counting a one, but now we're counting a zero. And so the fifth one is actually the number four entry. Okay, so an array's not too bad, is it? It's just clearing a declaring a potload of variables all at once. And then now the individual variable names are a composite of the name of the array plus the index of the array. And that gets me down to a particular one of those variables. If I wanted to think about this, kind of think, think can I think of a, this as a structure, let's take a look at this. Let me just add a new sheet in here. I'm going to say, yeah, we could have something like, you know, starts numbering here, 0 through 0, 1. And we can count that down to 35. Right next to it, we could like you know do some kind of I don't know some kind of order around this. Of course, this is all happening in memory, so we don't see it at all. And we could call this thing hotel. Is it called hotel or hotels? I think it's called hotel somewhere. And so now, when I refer to hotel sub one, I'm putting in Salt Lake City. Oops. If I go here and look at my names, of my hotels. Zero, 01, yeah, that's the one that's in Salt Lake. So Los Angeles is one, Phoenix is here. So if I want to think about this array in memory, if I want to think about it, of course, it's not on the worksheet ever. It's happening to just different variables in memory. This one's Los Angeles. This one's Phoenix. This one's Scottsdale. This one's Las Vegas. But as we as we populate those with a full text. You can think about it as just a structure like this. It's like a list with an index, and you just say, oh, go to the hotel array, find the number we're talking about, and that's the variable that we're after. And it turns out that, that actually in memory, these are sequential slots in memory. And one of the reasons that arrays are so efficient to work with is that it's not a different place in memory, different place in memory, different place in memory. If I'm going to iterate across that array, that is a sequential read of memory, and it happens very fast. So one of the reasons that we like to use arrays of variables when we've got iterative kinds of processing is because it's fast. It's one of the fastest things we can do. We refer to value by the array. Okay, how are we feeling about the idea of an array, an array of variables? Anyone shed any tears yet? Tell me, are you doing okay? It's going to get worse, but so far, how are we doing? So far, so good. Let's do something here that I don't think we've done yet, but it'll be helpful for this example. Every time so far when we've declared variables, whether it's an array of variables or individual variables, we've declared them inside of a subprocedure. That means that that variable is only available to code inside the subprocedure. I want this array to be available from more than one subprocedure, so watch this. I'm going to cut it out of here. It'll end my program. That's fine. And I'm just going to put it at the top of my module. Let's see, most of you probably have this option explicit. So I'll leave that in there. And I'm going to declare this variable here. This now is a module level variable or a module level array of variables, which means that any code in this module has access to it. So I've got you know, code in this subprocedure, a different subprocedure, a different subprocedure. They can all reference this variable. It's possible to make, it has to be code that's in this module. It's possible to even make a variable global. So that code in any module can access it. We'll talk about that later. For now, we're just saying this is available. Oh, by the way, why don't we go ahead and on this initialize, let's have another loop right here that just prints off. So we're reading in all those var variables, and now let's print them off. So I can read the value out of the variable of this these arrays just the same way that I do any other variable. Debug print <coughs> hotel sub x. The first time through the loop, this will be hotel sub zero. It'll print the one in Los Angeles, then the one in Salt Lake, then Phoenix, and so forth. 
Let me go ahead and print the X here as well. So now when I run this sub procedure, it should declare a couple of variables. Um, we'll also declare the hotel array. Run through and read them off the worksheet, put them into the array, and then in a separate process, print them right on. And the whole, the whole purpose of this sub procedure here is to get my array filled with the data that we need to work with. We're going to have two more arrays that we build today that we're going to get popular. But you can see it really has print out here's the value of X. Sheridan, Los Angeles, Hotel, Salt Lake, Phoenix, Las Vegas. Any questions about how these loops are working? Yes? So when I look in locals, uh, at the breakpoint, I can see all the values of the array, but after the breakpoint, when the sub ends, it closes them back up. Are they not in memory anymore? Yes, okay, so you're talking about this when, while this, uh, you're talking about the fact that this is up here. Yeah. This is a module level variable. Yeah. So I don't see those. Yeah, I don't see those variables. Let me, let, me, let me show the class what you're seeing. Okay. So let me put a breakpoint down here before we end. Stop. And run the code. Now, when we were together yesterday, it seems so strange to say yesterday we have to actually be right. When we were together yesterday, we got introduced to the locals window. So the locals window, not quite how I want it to dot. I guess that'll do. Not really where I want it to go either. Let's get rid of this. Okay, so I'm in break mode. I should be able to see the value for x. You know, here's d. You use the worksheet. Here is now the module one. Let's see. I should have a variable here called what? Why am I locked out? Come back to me. One. Well, I think we're about to find out if it's safe. Can I ask a question? Okay, go ahead. So here we are. I forgot what we were talking about. Oh, we're trying to see that in, to look at this array in the immediate window. So, or I'm sorry, in the locals window. So let me save and try this again. Maybe instead of putting a breakpoint in code, I'll just put a breakpoint on the end sub, run this, and then we'll look at our immediate window. Or I'll look at our locals window. So view locals, I'm going to leave it right where it is, even though my head might be blocking me. Under module one, I should be able to expand that out and see hotel. Here's hotel, and we can see, yeah, those are they're all filled in. The whole thing's here. That's so nice. Kind of collapses. It's handy. But even though this is a module level variable, as soon as I run past the end of this code, so no code is running, those all go away. Why doesn't that module level variable stay there? And the answer is that module level variable saves its value as long as any code is running. So I've got this sub procedure, it runs and calls this sub procedure, then calls this sub procedure, and then it's doing a loop in here, and then this sub procedure gets called and it comes back. While any of that code is running, that's all in memory. As soon as we drop out of that code, it's not obligated to keep those values anymore. But it may, uh, just depending on what else is happening while we're, while we're editing. If, if you now said uh, debug dot, or just in the immediate window, mm -hmm. Show me hotels. Show what's in hotels. You got nothing. It's undefined. Question in the back. Um, so you meant, so you just said that uh, it can switch between different sub procedures. Yes. But if, if we just ended this this sub procedure and erased it all, how does it know to not do that if it was going to run multiple sub procedures? Okay. So yeah, the question is, well, if this one just finished, how do we know we're going to run another one? And the answer is, it means the one sub procedure has to call the other one. Okay. When you start running, it can't be like, stop, now let's run another one. It has to be, this one starts running, and it calls another one without ever ending. And then that one can end, you can call another one, but I have to have at least one procedure running all the time. Okay. Whew. All right. So now, we've, kind of get, we've, we've gotten ourselves introduced to arrays. Let's talk about the problem that we're going to solve with these arrays. 
So we're going to suppose that you've been hired by the Starwood Corporation. It was your first job. You're just out of college. And you're going to work for the Western Regional Office. And you know, you talk to the manager who's hired you and he says, listen, these 36 properties that we have here, they've got, well, some of them are, are problem properties and some of them are just really knocking it out of the park. And we would like you, no one knows you work for us yet. We would like you to go and find out what's going well at the ones that are doing really well. And what's going right there and what's going wrong at the others. And so the first, we've got three months to do this before you ever show up. I just want you to go to all of these properties. And we're going to give you the corporate credit card. You're going to eat at all the restaurants. You're going to spend some time at the masseuse. Go to the pool. Might work out a little bit. Um, whatever they're in, we want you to, to find out about it. You know, and at first you think, this is great. And then you realize, these three months, I'm married. I've got kids. And uh, what are they going to do without me? No problem. We're renting you a van. Take the family. <laughs> You say, great, see you in three months. You gotta go to all of them, you know, before you show up. So, describe to me the order that you want to go. You're gonna have to go to all these hotels in some order. Describe to me a, a, a favorable characteristic of the order that you're gonna to choose to go these, to go to these. Which, which order you want to go to them in? So tell me something about the path. The, about the path you're going to choose. Region. You want it to be the shortest, shortest possible overall distance. Why? Because every minute in the van with the kids is one less minute with the masseuse. <laughs> <laughs> you want this to be as short as possible. Okay. So you got thirty. You got thirty-six properties here. What? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. You'll start in Salt Lake City. That's the closest one to where we are right now. Start there. Well, how are you going to figure out the next one to go to? Any thoughts? Just don't talk to me in VBA. Talk to me in English. <coughs> Google Maps. We're just going to go to Google Maps. <laughs> Drop them all into Google Maps and say, give us a route. Will that work? Yeah. No. Google Maps will do that for six, seven properties, and then we'll go to many. So Google Maps. Mm. Now, now, maybe what you'll just do is just plot them all, and then you'll just look at them and draw a pencil, and you'll go, oh, I want to go this way. And the truth is, that would give you, you could get a pretty good route that way. It wouldn't take that long. Is this like a made-up problem? Is this like a problem that people won't have to deal with in the world? Who deals with this problem tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times a day? Who does it? Fed, FedEx, UPS, DH, whoever they are. <laughs> They're going to solve this problem multiple, multiple, multiple times a day. Do they have time to put it out and draw a pencil and go, this is the way we're going to go? No. So, yeah, you, you, could, you could solve this with a pencil and Google Maps. But let's suppose you know, we have to solve it. We have to solve it with an, an algorithm. Any thoughts? How, how would we do it? Any thoughts? Come up with something. Go ahead. So, in this grid, you have the distance of each yeah, that's hotel what this is. from another hotel. So, this, this is the distance between, let's see, this is the distance uh, between the Stanley and Scottsdale and Salt Lake City. And so, so what I would do is look across the row and find the, the smallest number, and then take that corresponding hotel, because that's what you're going to go to next, and then look across its row or its column and find the smallest corresponding number, and then go to that one. Ah, I like it. it. Did you understand this? You said, listen, we're starting in Salt Lake City. Let me go ahead and kind of fill this in here so we can just look at a row without having to think about the column. We're starting in Salt Lake City. How do we find the next place to go? Just look across this and find the smallest number. Happens to be this one going to Las Vegas right here, 425 miles. Then, then go to go to Las Vegas. And from Las Vegas, find the smallest number, what? That we haven't been to yet. But the small, actually, the smallest one from Las Vegas, we go down here, it's actually going back to Salt Lake City. We'll say, go right back to Salt Lake City. So we gotta we have to say, find the smallest one that we haven't been to yet. And then just keep going through that until you've been through them all. That's a pretty good algorithm. I like, let me tell you what I like about this algorithm. This algorithm is, is, is pretty simple. You could describe it easily. I can understand it pretty easily. Thinking about it, the code's not going to be too bad to do that algorithm. Here's the thing I don't like about that algorithm. It's virtually guaranteed not to give me the shortest route. It'll give me a route, um, and that'll be good, but probably won't be the shortest route. Any other thoughts? Did you have a comment? Uh, I was just going to say that. that we were gonna, you, you could follow one path. That's right. Zoom across the you, that's exactly right, yeah. So, and that's the problem. This is a known algorithm. In fact, um, well, let's, 
I don't really play with a lot. If you like UPS, I've played this algorithm a lot. They've, they've played this problem a lot. So, you know, we're not the first ones to try to think about this deeply. I'm not sure we're really thinking about it deeply. Other thoughts? Any other algorithms? Doesn't have to be especially efficient, but give me an algorithm that would, that would give you a route, that would give you the shortest route. Go ahead. You, you look at this entire table with all of the distances, and you, you give arrays with all of the, all of the different combinations. Sets. Okay, you're saying calculate every possible route and then pick the shortest one. Calculate them all, pick the shortest one. Uh, that is actually the only known algorithm, that's the only algorithm that's guaranteed to produce the shortest route. This, this problem, um, it goes by a different name than, the, than the, the hotel problem. It's called the traveling salesman problem. Have you studied it anywhere else before you heard of it? Traveling salesman problem, we've been working on it for three, four hundred years. Uh, the idea is you got a salesman who has to go to all these different cities. Doesn't matter the order he goes to, you got to go to them all. Um, it's surprising that if you say he has to go home at the end, how much more complex that makes the problem than just I got to go to all the cities. Uh, mathematicians can spend their whole careers working on this. And, and if you think about it, from FedEx's position perspective or from UPS's perspective, it's much more complicated than this. Why? Because a left turn is way more expensive than a right turn. You got to come into traffic. You gotta wait, you gotta turn across traffic. It's more expensive because it takes longer to do it. And there's more likely to have an accident if you do it that way. And so it's, it's extremely complex. But that's the only algorithm. Let's take a look at what it would take to actually calculate that. How many properties do we have? We have 36 properties, 0 through 35, 36 properties. Uh, so how many different routes are there? I'm always surprised that somebody just takes that right off the top of their head, 36 factorial. Very good. Uh, so, fortunately, in Excel, we have the fact function. 36. Oops. Fact 36. And that will tell us that number. You know, the truth is, I never was very good with scientific notation. So, let me come to home and that come. I don't need the decimal points. That's how many different routes there are. One day I thought to myself, I'm going to solve this. Just I wrote a program that would calculate every possible route. I set it to run, and it wasn't done running by the end of the day. I went home, came back the next morning, still wasn't done running. So I interrupted, and I thought, I wonder how long, I said, I wonder how long this is going to take. And so I calculated how many routes that computer could calculate in a second. I was pretty impressed. It could calculate 5,000 routes in a second. That's how many seconds it's going to take to solve this problem. <laughs> I'm going to take that, I'll divide that by 60. That's how many minutes. That's how many hours. That's how many days. This how many years. Uh, <laughs> two five or something, I don't know. How did I get a... Oh, I've got a decimal point I didn't have before. We've got some of these have decimals in them. Let me get over to all these decimals. Those should be kind of decreasing, all decreasing instead of increasing. <laughs> okay, am I going to solve this problem? No. No, not with one computer. Actually, I read not too long ago that the one millionth piece, of, no, the one billionth PC had been created. Uh, a lot of these are out of service right now, but let's just use that as a good estimate for the the, pro the computing processor, the computing power of humanity. And so let's take this, if we put every computer in the world on this, and divide this by billion, that's how many years it's still going to take us to solve. But there's decimals, so it seems like it's... Oh, yeah, the decimals again. <laughs> anyway, that's our fault. Uh, okay, best scientific estimate for how old the universe is. 14.1 billion. Yeah, 14 billion, great. We'll take this, we'll divide that by 14, That's a number I understand. That's thousands, millions, hundred. To solve this problem, it's going to take 160, if we use all of humanity's processing power, it will take 168 billion? No, billions. Billions. 168 billion times as long as the universe has been in existence. Folks, you can drive. 
the worst route, faster than you can calculate the best route. Okay. So you've given us an algorithm that will work. We just can't actually calculate it. So who gave us the next nearest city algorithm? That's what we'll do. We're going to solve it. That's what we can calculate. At least give us a solution. Yeah. Wouldn't we also save on the calculations if we pick, we started each city and then did the to the next shortest city, the next shortest route? Because wouldn't that not be all those calculations? Yeah, in fact, that's what mathematicians do that work on this problem is they, they figure out shortcuts through this maze to say, you know what, there's a whole set over here that we can throw away. We are 99% sure that the best the best route is not anywhere in here. It's not, anywhere, it's not any of these that start with, start in Salt Lake, go to uh, uh, Seattle, then go to Phoenix. We're pretty sure that nothing after that is going to be the best route. Um, so it's, it's, it's how can you figure all that out analytically? And you know, folks really have spent their careers. As humanity, we've been working on this for hundreds of years. And so yeah, there are lots of interesting tricks that we can do. But this really is the only known algorithm that's guaranteed to give us a shortest route. Could we also, like, it wouldn't give you perfect, but could you cluster them so you could say things? Yeah, there's all kinds of great things we could do. It makes the coding a lot more difficult. And what we're really using this example for is we're using this example to understand arrays. Okay. And so we're not, we're, not, we're not trying to solve the world's problems here, hoping that, Fed, that FedEx will come and you know sweep us off our feet. You solved it with VBA, no less. <laughs> actually, actually, there is something else that this this is telling us. It looks like to me that the best route is going to go through Montana. Then let's go through Montana. This route go through Montana. Okay. All right, so uh, so that's the idea. So let's go ahead and get started on that on solving that problem. So what we're going to do is is let's talk about how we're going to like the arrays that we're going to need for this problem. So right here, where are my sheets? Oh, I lost that other sheet too that I already made that showed what our arrays look like. Let me build that hotel array again really quickly. So I have zero one. I'm going to take that down to thirty five. Thirty. No, 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 this is just a kind of a visual help for us to talk about what it is that we're creating. So you can just, this is just so we can have a sense, we can, we can kind of visualize what's happening in memory. We can, we can keep track visually of these arrays. So I've got the one here. We've already created this one called Hotel. Now, and what do we have here? We've got uh, Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, Scottsdale. Las Vegas. The ones I remember. Okay, so we've got that populated with you know the full names of those hotels. And here's what I would like to do. I would like to be able to have another instance of this, something similar to this, that I can use to keep track of the route that I'm that I'm building here. So I'll call this one route. But what I would like to do is I would like to put in here something to keep track of the order that I'm going. So I want to say start in Salt Lake City. So what should I put here to say start in Salt Lake City? Any thoughts? So we could put the name of it in here. That would be OK. But I think there's something that computation would be a little bit easier for us to work with. I heard over here. Yeah, put in 1. So 1 is the index for this array. 1 is the index. So this 1 means Salt Lake. So we'll put there at 1. And then how do I say next go to, how do I say next go to Las Vegas? Yeah, seven. And then, so I'm going to use this route array to figure out the order in which I want to go to all these. I got 36, I got 36 of them, number 0 through 35. I'm going to go ahead and get that filled in. Now, I need some way to be able to manipulate this set of numbers. And the truth is, I would like this to happen as fast as possible. It's going to be dramatically faster to read this off of an array than it is to be able to come and read this off of cells each time. Each time I say refer to this worksheet, this column, this row, it takes processing power to figure out the object I'm talking about. Whereas if instead I have built an array that has all that information in it, then I'm able to jump to that information much, much more quickly. When I say much more quickly, what does it mean? It means I'm shaving off a millisecond, or, or around a millisecond, maybe less, for each time that I'm trying to, to pull that value. And in a situation where I might be doing millions of iterations, depending on where we're going, this one won't take that many. I'll have a substantial number of iterations that I'm doing that's going to be more efficient. 
The most important thing is we're trying to learn about arrays for crying out loud. And so we're going to make an array to hold all that data. So why don't you go ahead, what I'd like you to do is take 30 seconds and create the route array. It's going to be, it's going to be different than the hotel array in two respects. So go ahead and declare that array. Uh, make it a module level array, just same place where we have a hotel array. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do that. Think about the two differences that we're going to need for that declaration. Yeah, do it right next to the declaration for the hotel. You can go before or after, it doesn't matter. There's going to be two differences. Okay, how many of you thought, think, yep, I got it? Anyone say, got it? No one? Anyone think, hey, I'm pretty close, I might have it? All right, let's take a look. So it's gonna, I'm gonna, it's so close, I'm gonna copy this line. Now, it's not, the, what first difference is it has to have a different name. What should I call it? Route. Route. And what's the other difference? Yeah, we don't want strings, we want integers. You can probably get by with byte, but let me put an integer here. For this example, we definitely could get by with byte. But, you know, if we ever want to kind of push this larger than 255 properties, it would be nice, to, or 256 properties, um, I don't want it to come back and declare my variables and just... So that's it. So it has to have a different name, and it's got a different data type. So far, so good. How many of you were close? Yeah. Okay. So far, what we've dealt with are what we call single dimension arrays. They will get more complex as soon as we turn them into multi dimension arrays. So we look at it here. Uh, we look over here at our distance. I want to build an array that can hold all of this data. If I have to make one long single dimensional array to hold it, it's going to get ugly because I have to think, well, here, the first 36 is from Las Vegas, or is, all the distance is from Los Angeles. The next 36 are all the distances from Salt Lake City. The next 36 are all the differences from Phoenix. But if I can make two dimensions, I can actually visualize this as a grid, similar to what we have here on the sheet. So let's do that. Ready? Here we, do, here we go. Dim distance, 35, that gives me 36 elements, by, comma, 30. Now, instead of having one dimension of 35, I've got 35 rows of 35. Can you think of it as 35 rows of 35? Or 35 columns of 35. I've got 36, thank you. I've got a, I've got a square structure now. You get it in type as well as, what should it be? Give me a good data type. This stuff you will want to know for the, for the exam. This is a, it could be a question very similar to this on the exam. Long would be a long integer. integer. No good. Double. Double. Double would work. It's not the best choice. Float is the wrong language. I should put, I should, I should put float as an option, just for you guys that are you know, coming from C. Oh, yeah, float. That's the one. Single? Single. Yeah, single is the one. So single precision floating point number. So single. Remember, the difference is that you know, single is just going to be not as precise. Um, not as big or not as precise, but definitely you've got like 15 digits to work with when you're working with singles, so there's plenty. Okay. <coughs> Incidentally, folks, so what that array is going to look like is, well, it'll start off looking kind of like this one. You just kind of draw that one right here. Let me go ahead and just kind of put the grid on this as well. Oh, that's tiny. Okay, so now over here I've got my distance array. <coughs> and I am going 
issue and it was just a little small guy. Go to 35, but I guess you get the idea. Okay, so what am I going to have right here? What goes right there? Yeah, zero. That's the diagonal. That's the distance from Los Angeles to Los Angeles. So right along this diagonal is O is going to be zero. What number do I have right here? I don't know, whatever number is over there. 691, 374, 653. 691, 374. What's the next one? 653. And of course, they're more precise than that. Okay, so th these are the structures that I'm going to work with. These are the arrays that I'm going to create to be able to work with and solve this problem. So, tell me, as soon as I declare the hotel array, it's an array of variables, string variables. What? What is going to be in this as soon as I declare it? Empty strings. Empty strings, yeah, zero length strings. What's going to be in my route array as soon as I declare it? Yeah, it won't be it won't be empty because these are numeric variables. And so you, you they have to have some number. And so it could be zero, it'll be, zero. It'll be zeros. Now, it turns out there's a problem with having this full of zeros to start. What's the problem? What am I using this route for? This route is to tell the cities that I'm, you know, the cities I'm going, but I'm using it for something for an interim step. Because you told me when I'm trying to figure out the next city, what do I have to what do I have to choose from? Uh, all the cities that have not yet. Yeah, all the cities that aren't already in the route. And so let's think about the very first choice that we're going to make. Or at some point, if we got a bunch of zeros in here, what does that say? It says we've already been where? To zero. Yeah, you've already been to Los Angeles. You can never find Los Angeles if you leave this full of zeros. That's a problem that we would come across if I didn't kind of warn you about this, but since we're trying to initialize these arrays, we need to have this full of starting off with some value that's not in the valid range that we could be dropping into. So let's start off. We've already initialized the hotel array. Let's now initialize the route array. What should we put there? There's like 64,000 possible values that we could use. Most of them are good. Which ones are no good? Zero, zero, zero to 35. Anything else would do. So I'll just do this. I'm going to come right down to here to where we're initializing this array. In fact, I'm just going to copy that. Well, copying that probably didn't do much for it. Maybe delete most of it. <coughs> it almost all. <laughs> I saved the X and the X. Route sub X equals, and why don't I just drop here negative 1? So negative 1. I don't like going larger than. You know, in the positive side, because I might want to expand this problem. And, you know, if I put it right at 37, that's what I'm never going to get to. But I could pretty easily expand this to 37 and whatever I want to do. So I'm not going to go negative. You know, some people say, well, why don't you go to the smallest value you could? Negative 32,768. That would be a fine thing to do as well. I'm going to put one. Okay, so I've now initialized those two arrays. If, and I'm going to, just for kicks, I'm going to run right to here. I'm going to save first because who knows why that died before. I'm going to run to here and then let's just take a look at route sub 4, negative 1. Route sub 34, negative 1. Route sub 14, negative 1. All filled in, right? And if we look at hotel, <coughs> that's filled in with the name of someone. So, our first, so now those first two arrays that we have over here, they're populated with how we want to start. Now, let's populate this one right here. Let's start off just by populating the first row. And even though I could build this kind of inside this same loop, I'm going to make another loop for it. In fact, I'm just going to work right on top of this debug.print loop. Ignore that print, and we're going to do here. Okay, so our declaration for this, dim distance, has two indices. So when we refer to an element of this array, we have to refer to it using both indices. So I'm not worry about the variable just yet, and let me put in here the name of the array, distance. I want to look at that very upper left-hand corner. What do you think I'm going to put here? Zero, zero, zero. very good. And to have that equal, my, my distance sheet, d.cells, 
and the first plot is row number two, column number two. And what are the values? If I think about the next one, it's definitely going to have to look on the same row, different column, so it's going to be column number three. Now, which one of these is the row and which one's the column? Who said that? Say it louder. Whatever you choose. Whatever you choose. How this is actually organized in memory is one long contiguous set of memory addresses. There's no, it's not a square. It's not a rectangle, it's not a circle, it's one long stream of values. This way that we're thinking of this as a square, it's just a mental fiction. And so I can think of this as row column or column row as long as I'm consistent. And so I'm going to choose to do it row column because that's the way that, that the indices for cells work. And if I think of them the same way, I think it'll be a little more helpful. So I'm going to stay on row zero and I'm going to go to column one. I'll do one more hard coded and then we'll build it into the variables. This is going to be row zero, column two, and so row two, column four. So if I think about the sequence that I need, it looks pretty easy. I just drop x right in here, and that'll give me zero, one, two. That's what x is going to do, zero, one, two. So I'll put x here, and then over here, this one's, this first number is constant across. I'm not worried about that one. What do I put here? x plus two. It'll be, when x is 0, it'll be 2. When it's 1, it'll be 3. It'll be 4, so that looks great. So that should be the loop that I need just to load up that first row of my distance array. There's a question here in the back. Yeah. So isn't it set by the fact that you're using cells? Aren't the row and columns set by the simple fact that you have the cells that's coming next? OK, so the question is, hey, is there some you know, real connection between the fact that I'm referring to cells here and I'm dropping that into here. And the answer is no. I could reverse these indices, and this would work just fine. This would now fill up that first column, or I could think of it as filling up that first row. It, it really is just the way that I think of it. Because it's, the fact that we're thinking of it as a grid is just a fiction. It's a fiction that just helps us think of this array. It really is one, and they're contiguous in memory. It is one memory address right next to the other, right next to the other. I mean, think of it. If you look at that chip with a microscope, what shape would it be in? I don't know, but I'm here to tell you it's not a square. So th this really is just, as long as we're consistent, either way is going to work fine. If you want to think of it as row and column and think that's really the way it is, that's healthy. Row and column. So in the, the grid that we have on the distance worksheet, it's only half filled in. Uh -huh. Aha! And so won't this produce this, uh, this distance array that we created? Won't it produce half values that are blank? So far, all we're doing is the first row. But yeah, you're thinking we're going to extend this to where it's going to do multiple rows, and we've got a problem to deal with here. Yep, we've got to deal with that. Okay. We're going to deal with it. We're going to deal with it in the next 12 minutes. Okay, so let me let me run it to here, and let's just kind of peek around and see what we've got going on. So hotel and route are still the same. Now let's look at distance. Row number zero, column number one. That should be that number right there, 691.13. E-I-S-T-A-N-C-E. There's that number. If I go to the next column over, number two, it should be the 374.37. There it is. So we've got this array, at least the first row of this array filled up. Right? If we look on any other, we've only ever written to row number zero. If we look on any other row, I'm just going to have what? What am I going to see? What will I see here? Negative uh, one. Zero. It would be zero. We, we initialized the route array as negative one, but we haven't initialized the distance array with anything. Yeah, so it's, it's zero. Okay, here's the trick. We needed to run this line 36 times. So we put it inside a loop. We go 36 times. That goes right across every column. <coughs> we need to do that same thing how many times? That whole thing we have to do how many times? 36, 36 times. We've got to do it for the row, the next row, and the next row. So what are we going to do? Another variable. Another variable and another loop. Another loop. It'll be a loop, another loop inside this loop. So let me declare dem y as an integer. 
And actually, why don't we go ahead and build it on the outside of this loop? 4y equals 0, 2, 3, 5. And then next down here, I'm going to go ahead and bring this in a little bit so that I can see that's a loop within a loop. And now, instead of 0, what do I put here? Y here, and we'll do Y plus 2 here. And if you think about it, this whole thing is just shifted off. Instead of starting at 0, it starts at row 2, column 2. So this whole thing is just shifted away from 0 by 2. Okay, that looks pretty good. Go ahead and run this again to my breakpoint. Now we'll look at distance row number one, column number two. There's 635. Let's look a little deeper. Let's go to row number 13, column number 24. There's another number. This, this now is filled in. But now is the is the, the point that the, the student asked here in the front is we're we're reading across this whole row, and then the next time we're reading across here, that number is there because I typed it in. It's not there for all of you. But we're reading a bunch of zeros in here, aren't we? Hey, what does this array start with? It's actually, we're not reading zeros. What are we reading? We're reading blank. What happens if we take a blank value and try to assign it to an integer? Zero. Yeah. So it goes, can't, integer can't be blank. You nut. It can't be blank, so what does it do? What do most respectable programming languages do if you try that? It goes, you can't do that. Stop. Cut it out. You can't do that. BBA doesn't. BBA goes, ah, blank, that's kind of like zero. I'll make it zero. It's really what it does. It's trying to, it's trying to figure out what's the closest thing it can do. So, yeah, so we're writing blank to it. BBA goes, oh, we're going to write zero to it. But what's already there? Zero is already there. As soon as I declare this array, it's full of zeros. And so there's no reason for us to read this. So watch this, folks. This was something that you want to, this is kind of tricky here. Is there any reason for me to read this cell right here? No. So when I'm on row zero, I need to start, I should start at column one. When I'm on row one, I should start at column two. When I'm on row two, I should start at column, do you see a pattern here? Okay, so when x, when y is zero, my row is zero, my x should start where? One. So what expression do I put here? Y plus one. Oh, we have never put anything besides an integer right here in this loop before. And once I put an integer, I can put an expression that evaluates to an integer. So now, coming to the loop the first time, y equals zero. Comes down here, x is going to start at one. So the first one I write to is going to be row zero, column one. And we're going to look at row two, column three is the first one that I'm going to read. I'm going to do that 36 times, or 35 times. Uh, oh, x is going to equal 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, up, 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 35. It finishes. It's done with this loop. It hits this next. What does that do? It's y. Now y is 1. We're still in the proper range here between 0 and 35. So we come down here. We start this loop again. We start x again. It's going to start at now 1 plus 1. It's going to start at 2. We're starting it again. And so now when y is 1, x is 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through to 5. We're done with that loop. We increment this again. Y is now 2. We start here at x at 3, all the way to 35, and so forth. And that loads up that whole array. So now we're still only getting this part of the data, but at least we're not spending any time reading this part. Oh, and incidentally, let's look at the very last row. How much information is on this very last row? Nothing. There's nothing in the last row. There's no reason to read that. So what do we change so we don't read that row? 34. Yeah, which one do we go to 34? Uh, okay. Y. Yeah, y is going to go to 34. No reason to read that. It doesn't hurt to read it. I mean, it doesn't take that long. There's nothing there for us to read. And in fact, by the time we get down here, think about this. When this is 35, what does X start at? Yeah, X starts at 36. It doesn't throw an error, but it's, not, it's, starting, it's starting out of bounds, and so it doesn't even jump into the loop on that last one. Okay. Now, here's the magic part, folks. 
we have to fill in the other diagonal of this array. First of all, why do we need that diagonal at all? Don't we have all the data we need just right there in the, in the right-hand half? Yeah, so here's the problem. Let's suppose we want to find out what's, what's close to Las Vegas. Where's Las Vegas? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here's Las Vegas. What do I have to do to find out all the distances to Las Vegas? I gotta look down part of the column until I get to the where the X and Y are the same, and then I gotta look across. Would that be all that difficult to do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, once you saw the code, you go, that's not too bad. It's a little bit to think about how to do it. So what I'd really like to see is I'd like to see those same numbers just put right here, because if those are in here, now I can just pick a row or a column and go straight across. All the data I need are right there. That's gonna make our, our job a little bit simpler. And all these variables down here in this corner, they're already declared. I don't save any memory by putting zeros here instead of putting you know, 600 in here. It's the same amount of memory allocated for that. So there's no memory savings. It's going to make my, my problem a little bit easier to solve. The, the code will be simpler. I like it. So how do we do it? At, at one point, we've got this value that we're writing into the array. Let's, look, let's use this one. So when I'm on row zero, column, row zero, column two. The same as row two, column zero. I need to go to row two, column zero. When I'm on row zero, column three, it's row three, column zero. What's the difference? I just, I just flip the X and the Y. Could it really be that simple? It is that simple. I'm just going to copy this line, and I'm going to change the position of X and Y. Problem solved. Let me go ahead and run this. I think I've still got a breakpoint down here. So we'll stop and run this. Now I'll look at distance 13, 24. It gives me that number. I'll reverse those. 24, comma 13. And it gives me the same number. We've now filled that whole array in. Now the luxury of just looking across a row, looking across a column, we can see all the distances from the city that's represented by that row. Questions? How do you have to switch the ones on the right as well? How do you put the VA and plus zero and the Y plus zero on the right? <sighs> okay, here's a good question. Why don't we switch these as well? And the answer is, if I were to switch these, then I'm changing where I'm reading from. So here, I'm, I'm reading from here and putting it in the upper right-hand corner, if I switch the indices for the array, I'm still reading from here, but writing to this location. If I switch them both, I'm writing to this location, but I'm reading from this location. There's nothing there to read. Yeah. So that's pretty good. We've done a pretty good job here. This isn't too bad. So we've got a nested loop. The inner loop starts at a different place depending on where the outer loop is. And then we kind of fill in the opposite diagonal of this. I like it. One more idea that I want to express to you here, and that is when we declare this array this way, it, this is what's referred to as a, a fixed array. It's always going to be that size. Turns out we can declare this as a dynamic array, meaning that we can change the size of the array as we're going. Here's how we do it. I am just going to take hotel, and I'm going to get rid of the number. I leave the parentheses. That says, we're going to have an array here. We don't know how big it is. We'll, we'll decide how big it is later. Here's the thing, is that this, we, we cannot have an, ex, an expression that has to be evaluated here. This has to be a constant. When I'm declaring a variable, you remember that variables get declared before code starts executing. Right? We're saying, got to run this sub-procedure. Let's find all the variables, allocate the memory, and then we start running. So what I can't do is say, oh, I wonder how many cities we're going to have. Oh, we've got 35 cities. Declare the array that size. Because this happens before I start executing anything. But if I leave that blank, and when I come here to my initialize, before I do anything else, I can say I want to dim that array, hotel, and then I can put the 35 in here. And this can be calculated, right? The whole point is we can, we can find out what that is. We can't say dim. Dim's already used. It's already been declared. So if we want, if we want to dim it again, what would we do? We would redim it. 
<laughs> That's what it is. Rename that array. And so this has created what's, what's called a dynamic array. And the key here is that we can figure out how many we need and make the size based on that. So this um, sets the size of a dynamic array. And then this is a, a dynamic array. So they, the only difference is in the declaration is that when it's dynamic, I don't put how many there is. And I can change the size later. I can make it bigger. I can make it smaller. We'll play with this next time we get together. Folks, typically when we introduce a new idea, we spend a day on it. We've got one more day on this. The arrays are pretty heavy duty. We'll finish off this example when we get together on Monday. Last question. Yeah, maybe I misunderstood you, but it sounded like you said that we can, like when we rename that array, it, it sounded like you said that we should like solve for that number. Yeah, yeah, we can do this. Uh, X equals 35, rename X. And that would happen for the sub start? No, 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 the rename is an executable statement. So, so redim actually calculates the ex and executes. It's the dim that happens before any code starts running. All right, folks, you should be feeling like your head is a little bit in the clouds over this right now. That's okay. Yeah, mission accomplished. Don't feel too bad about this. Take the test. None of this is on the test. We'll spend more time on this Monday. I do encourage you to do the test before we spend more time on this. If you can do it this week, that'd be great. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed.